Good morning. Uh, Captain Justin DeLeon here from the University of Iowa, APMS here at Iowa, and also the MS3 instructor. Uh, today we're going to be talking about platoon movement uh, from a secure location all the way to our final security halt before we occupy and establish our ORP. So to go over the terminal learning objective, uh, I want to read it verbatim for you. So purpose of the operation and purpose of this lesson is to demonstrate a doctrinally sound way. Again, this may not be the perfect way, it's not the only way, but this is going to be a doctrinally sound way that we can conduct platoon movement in a tactical environment from that secure location uh, to the final security hole. Um, doctrine that I'm going to be referencing is ATP 3-21.8, uh, Infantry Platoon and Squad. And then last but certainly not least is the Ranger Handbook 2017 uh, SH21.76. So first of all, there's some major steps that I want to hit on. Uh, the first step that I want to hit on that we need to do is identifying the mission. All right? And this is obviously going to be very simple. Uh, the mission's most likely going to be given to us in some type of op or FRAGO format. Uh, but the reason why it's important is that every mission does have a little bit different uh, specifications. So specifically, if I'm doing a raid or an ambush, likely the initial movement to that ORP is going to look the same. However, if I'm doing a movement to contact and doing the subtask of a search and attack underneath that movement to contact, I may not be required to go and do an ORP. And so that movement might be different. My movement techniques might be different. Uh, so today, for today's um, planning, we're going to work under the assumption that we're going to be doing a platoon raid. So that is the assumption that we're going to be working under today. All right. However, this movement will look very similar to ambush as well as attack and recon. So all these are going to look very similar. There might be some minor changes, but overall this is going to look the same for all four of those type of missions. All right. So when we're going through our mission, the first thing that we need to do is make a assumption of what kind of formation you want to use. Um, again, we have lots of formations at the platoon level, where we, whether we're echeloning right, we're echeloning left, we're working in a V, we're working in a line, a file. Today we're going to work under the assumption that we're working under a platoon column. All right, so we're going to talk through that. We got that first squad in order of march with that point man moving first. So this is our first squad in order of march. Behind him, we're going to have the PL. Behind him, we're going to have that second squad, followed by that platoon sergeant, and then followed by our third and final squad. And this is straight out of uh, 321.8, all right? The thing I want to make sure I focus on is that the PL and the platoon sergeant can move anywhere in the formation that they deem necessary. That PL is in charge of, one, moving that platoon to the first location and making sure they get there, but also making sure that he maintains contact with higher the whole time. The platoon sergeant, really within this, he's ensuring accountability is kept at all time, and he's moving and trying to control that formation and making sure we have security established always. All right, the next, th last thing I wanna mention is that fourth squad, that weapon squad. Doctrinally, according to 321.8, we got a machine gun team here near the PL, so the PL can quickly uh, use him where he needs, where he deems necessary. And then we got a machine gun also with the platoon sergeant. All right, they're countered, one's going left, one's kind of on the right side, so we're ready to react to fire to any direction. All right, and that's typically why we use that platoon column as well um, in, in any, any time because we have appropriate firepower to the front, to the left, to the right, and to the rear at all times. All right, uh, last thing I want to mention here is, again, the, when you're briefing this for your scheme of maneuver uh, during an operation order, you don't have to brief it perfectly doctrinally. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe we have elevated terrain or a ridge line over to our east. And maybe it makes more sense that that's the most probable line of, or pro most probable location where we will receive contact. And maybe I put both machine guns on my east side of my formation because I'm concerned about taking fire from that location. So just make sure you know that that's all METC dependent and especially terrain. Okay, so we got our formation uh, figured out. Now the next thing that we're going to brief and talk about is our movement technique. All right. Obviously there's only three movement techniques. We got traveling, we got traveling overwatch, and we got bounding overwatch. And that's kind of where I hit in if we're doing a movement to contact. At some point we're probably going to move to that bounding overwatch as we try to identify the enemy before he identifies us. However, since we're working under a raid, 
we're going to probably most likely work under the traveling overwatch. So traveling again is when enemy contact is not likely. And really the only time you're going to be using traveling is when you're behind friendly lines uh, and you're not really in a hostile environment. So anytime we're going into a hostile environment or a potentially hostile environment, it's pretty safe to go with that traveling overwatch. So today we're going to work under the assumption that we're moving at traveling overwatch. And again, just to re just to go over it real quick, uh, traveling overwatch, we're obviously moving at a slower pace of speed, uh, but we're maintaining doctrinally, we're maintaining 50 meters uh, between squads minimum. Obviously we can go further if we think we need to, and that kind of is the Met TC or terrain dependent, but 50 meters is the minimum according to 321.8. Okay. We got our formation. We got our, our uh, movement technique. Let's talk about route planning real fast. So this is an important part as you are discussing um, how you're going to be moving in your scheme maneuver. There's three uh, major ways to do route planning and way to talk about it as we look at 321.8. The first is terrain feature. And really, a lot of times we use the term hand railing. This is the main thing that we use when we use terrain features. So let's say there's a road right here that we're going to be moving along. And let's say, hey, the easiest way to move to an objective or to a potential ORP location is to handrail this road. Really what that is is using a terrain feature to guide your movement. Maybe there's a river that you're going to handrail. Maybe you're coming up with certain legs and there's a well-known hilltop in this vicinity. And you're going to move to that hilltop and then move to another smaller hilltop and maybe that's going to lead you up to your ORP. It's using a terrain feature kind of as a waypoint or as a guide to get you to where you want to go. All right, the next one we're going to talk about is contouring. Uh, this is probably the least likely of the one that you're going to use, but really what contouring does is it, it's, it, it's keeping you at a standard elevation so you always know where you're at. So if you're really where it would be successful is let's say you're working along a ridge line, and if you're moving, you're going to move along this contour line right here, and you're going to stay alongside it. And if you move along that, you're pretty much going to always know where you're at on the map. Technique. Lastly, which is the one we use a lot, is going to be uh, working at azimuth legs, and it's called uh, cross compartment. Really, it's talking about, hey, I'm going to move roughly at a 45 degrees for 200 meters. I'm going to hit a point there, then I'm going to move north. Let's say I'm going 10 degrees at 400 meters. Obviously, this is not the scale. And then lastly, I'm going to move at 328 degrees at 200 meters. All right, to my ORP. All right, so that is something that we need to talk about when we're doing our brief and make sure we're hitting that on when we do our scheme maneuver. So everyone has at least written down, yes, the point man's responsibility is to lead us there, but when the point man goes down or when something else happens, everyone else has situational awareness of where we're going and how we're getting there. All right, so for today, uh, as we talk through our scheme maneuver, we're gonna talk as if we're doing uh, cross compartment. So we're using azimuth legs. So we're going to start here, we're going to move 280 meters at 30 degrees. We're then going to move north at 5 degrees for 400 meters. And then we're going to move northwest roughly 340 degrees for 200 meters. So that's, going to that's kind of how we're going to talk it as we do our scheme maneuver. So. First thing is, is we're going to move out of our, whether we're in a patrol base or maybe we're behind friendly lines in some type of assembly area, regardless of what it is, we're going to identify a line of departure that we're going to be crossing. A lot of times we just refer to this as the LD. And the LD stands for our line of departure. All right. So there's a couple things to note is the LD is a key point that we want to identify and we want to know where it's at. A lot of people just call up LD as they're crossing. We want to know a specified designated point on the map. And the reason is, is because that triggers some things. If we are in friendly lines, maybe that triggers when we are, our movement technique changes to bounding overwatch or maybe traveling overwatch. It also gives us uh, a point on the map that we know when we need to call reports up to higher. All right. So one of our things that we need to brief very well during our scheme maneuver is talking about when we communicate to higher. So the LD is clearly a point where we're communicating with higher hey, we're starting our formation or we're starting a movement. We have this many people. This is our formation. This is our first leg. This is our first azimuth. You know, we're moving out. That way, higher, which you might be a very small piece of their pie, 
they can see how all the pieces are formulating and they can either tell you to hold back, continue to push harder, whatever it is to meet that overall higher intent, whether it's at the company, battalion, or even higher uh, level. All right, so once we cross that LD, what we need to make sure we do identify in the vicinity of that LD is what we call an initial rally point. All right, so I'm just gonna put it on here on the board as an IRP, an initial rally point. The reason we need to make and identify something right away is that if we come into contact or if something happens that you know, makes us need to break contact from the mission or maybe we become compromised in some way, right away we set up a fallback point that's standardized throughout. Because what happens, and we make sure that higher knows where that point is, because what happens is, let's say we take contact early on, we start running back towards friendly lines, all of a sudden friendly lines see you know, a horde of people moving towards it, it's unorganized, they're not moving to a specific location, you know, the, the, the probability of fratricide raises uh, quite a high. So we need to make sure we make that. All right, so we're gonna move out. So we're moving out from that IRP and we're moving along, all right? Now, the first thing that we need to do, the first halt that we need to focus on is what's called a silent listening halt. All right, it's also typically referred to as a SEALs halt, a shortened version of it. Um, there is no standard distance away from your LD or your line of departure where to make this. It is completely uh, on the platoon leader when he needs to make it. What I would say is it probably needs to happen within your 100, first 100 to 150 meters. And really what we're doing is we're doing that halt. So I'm gonna write on here as seals. We're doing that halt to acclimate to the environment. All right, and we're doing that halt to make sure that everything sounds natural, I guess, to where we're at. So when we go there, all right, the, the, the um, hand arm signal that we use here at the University of Iowa with our left hand is we cup our ear, all right? And that tells everyone in that formation that we're doing a seal salt. So obviously the hand arm signal moves back to the front. Everyone does it if it's done correctly, all right? And then we all take a knee and we all sit there and we listen. And really what we're listening for is any enemy movement, any animals moving around, anything that's showing us that's unnatural to the terrain. Um, and a lot of times I'm telling you, to work in SEALs halts in your operation is very effective all right, to find potential enemy ambushes, to find any friendlies that are in your AO. A lot of times it's gonna bring a lot of, um, I guess, a better observation to your platoon. So SEALs halt is definitely a must. You have to do at least one SEALs halt in your operation and it must be done in the, right away to make sure no one's following you. SEALs halt are encouraged throughout your operation. All right, there's not a standard number. You should not do eight or 20, but when you get to new locations that you haven't been at, again, if later on, if we do a leader's recon, SEAL salts are very effective to acclimate to the environment and to feel confident about where you're at, that there's no enemy in the area. All right, so let's say we did our SEALs halt about 100 meters in, and now we're gonna continue to move, all right? What we're now gonna begin to establish is what we call in-route rally points. All right, so let's say we move to this first leg right here. This is an optimal location to make an in-route rally point because it's the end of our leg and it's moving up, all right? Does it have to be at that location? No, we could have made another one earlier on if we wanted to. However, doctrinally, in-route rally points, the term it says is usually, usually they're made every 100 to 400 meters of movement. That is how often you wanna make your in-route rally points, all right? And the way we use in-route rally points is it's really a fallback point, all right, to where everyone understands where it's at and can move to it, all right? The thing we struggle with most with in-route rally points, which here at the University of Iowa, we twirl our hand like this, and then we point to something on the ground, a location, all right? And you point to it as you walk past that location. I'm not standing back 100 meters from it and pointing forward to where it's at. In route rally points have to be easily identifiable, all right? Whether it's a huge boulder, a huge tree stump, something completely out of the ordinary where everyone can, down to the lowest private can see it and be like, yes, I understand what that is. Also something to take into consideration, a lot of times in route rally points that are chosen are not defendable locations. An in route rally point, again, is that fallback location if a, some type of contingency is put into place, whether you took indirect fires or direct fires, you're gonna fall back to that location. If you can't defend there, it's a bad point. If your in route rally point is a huge boulder, but it's in, the open, in an open field, 
it's not going to be uh, sufficient for what you need. So something to consider as well. All right, so let's say we're moving. We're making our in route rally points along our way. All right. Something I just want to mention as well is you do not fall back to your last in route rally point. All right, you fall back two behind. So if I'm up in this vicinity, and let's say an event is triggered, whether it's direct fire, indirect fired, and I need to fall back to an in route rally point, I am not falling back to this first one. I'm falling back two behind. All right. Uh, that's kind of on the SOP side a little bit, but it is also out of the old doctrine out of FM 7-8. Uh, so, but that is a little more SOP, but it's much safer to fall back two behind than to fall back to the last one. And the real reason is I make this in route rally point. Let's say I move 25 meters forward, I take contact. Moving back 25 meters is probably not going to be sufficient to break contact uh, from where I'm going. Okay, so we're moving from our in route rally points. All right, we take our final leg and then we move to this final security halt. And really, this final security halt is where our movement's gonna end before we start to kick out to establish and occupy that ORP. So let's talk real fast a little bit about security, all right? A security halt is, is an important step and you can take as many as you need throughout. There is that final security halt, however. And what I wanna talk about is when we do our silent listening halts or our security halts is quick establishment of security. All right, we call that halt, all right, we call that halt or that freeze. Within five to 10 seconds, everyone's on a knee. All right, there's no reason for anyone to be standing up. We don't want that. All right, again, this is not doctrinally based, but a good SOP, five to 10 seconds on a knee, and then typically 30 seconds to a minute, you're going in the prone. All right, making sure that you're secure, making sure you have good fields of fire and observation. But let's just talk real fast. We're, let's say we got this lead squad here. All right, they're in a squad column fire team wedge. When that security halt is placed, or security halt is put in place, it's pretty easy for everyone to kind of move out, find some cover, and be looking in all directions. All right, this guy's getting his team, team leaders. All right, and then these guys are looking this way, these are looking this way. And we're doing this with every squad. And what kind of starts to form is this cigar shape. And this is straight out of the Ranger handbook right here, is that when you do a security halt, you take a general cigar shape and make sure that you have security on all sides. I think what we tend to see a lot of times, um, in, especially with cadets, is that we get that security halt and you just kind of take a knee and start hanging out, waiting for someone to come tell you what to do. The point of that is, if we're doing a security halt, we're likely gonna be there for five to 10 minutes, if not longer. Uh, maybe we're doing a map check, you know, maybe we're at that final security halt and we're gonna actually push out a recon to establish that ORP. So security is paramount. So we gotta make sure we establish that every single time. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about is some contingencies. And when you're briefing your scheme maneuver and we're talking through our movement up and we're hitting these different points, we need to talk about things that may come into play, all right? A lot of times on a map, we're gonna, by doing a map recon beforehand, we're gonna see if there's a major road in our way or a linear danger area, all right? We're gonna see that. But often, we're moving and the map's not updated and there's a large trail that's cut in or there's a fire break that's cut in and all of a sudden we have this linear danger area. So we need to brief that contingency and brief how we're gonna do that. Are we gonna do that according to a certain SOP or are we gonna do that according to the Ranger Handbook? What is the method? So we need to make sure we have that contingency in place. We need to have the same thing for an open danger area. Uh, all these things that could ha have affect us on the battlefield. All right, if we come, to, come into civilians on the battlefield, if we come into media on the battlefield, any of, those, any of those things that could happen, we wanna make sure we're prepared for and everyone understands how we're gonna to react to it. And then lastly, we know that there's eight forms of contact that we can come into at any time. I'm not gonna list all eight, but obviously the ones that are most gonna, likely gonna affect us are if we come in direct and indirect fire. And what, do, what are our actions on that? And again, a lot of times that might be a battle drill, it might just be react to contact, but maybe you have specific instructions that you want them to say is, hey, on leg one, if we're doing leg one and we come into direct fire contact with a you know, squad size element or higher, hey, our mission's compromised, we're gonna break contact and move back to the IRP or we're gonna move back to friendly lines. Maybe you have specific instructions that hey, if, we get, if we're too close to the objective and we come into direct fire contact, we've probably come in contact with the objective or at least the objective is now gonna know that we're coming. 
and it's time to move somewhere else and call higher and potentially recommend that we don't do that mission. Whatever it needs to be, but we need to make sure that we hit those throughout because what we don't want is people moving different legs and not understanding what their actions are going to be on that contact and where they're going to go. But, so overall, what we talked about today is the movement from that initial location, all right, moving to that final security hole. The things that we focused on is that we got to identify our mission because that's going to have an effect on our movement, our formation, our technique, our, our route and the way we're planning it, the method we're using to plan that route, what actions at the line of departure, actions at that initial rally point, in route rally points along the way, and then what we're talking about is that final security hole and what security needs to look like and how important it is. And then lastly, we got to make sure that throughout the operation, we're listing those contingencies and talking about what's going to happen if something that's it maybe not likely, but if it happens, how do we react? All right, so terminal learning objective, purpose of the operation was to demonstrate the movement there. Again, this is not the perfect way, but it is a doctrinally sound way. I did throw some SOPs in there, uh, but this is a way to do it. And I hope you, hope you enjoyed it. Hope it helps out with you. Uh, again, I'm Captain DeLeon from the University of Iowa. Rangers lead the way.